I'm Dave Walbazer. I, contrary to what you're seeing on the screen there, um, that's just a legacy of not getting my act together yet. Um, I'm the new, new president and I was elected this past November. So I'd like to welcome all, any new members that we have um, since December. And uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself and mention how you heard of us and what motivated you to join, you're welcome to go ahead and give us that uh, information if you like. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name's Matt Ridgeway. I just joined in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. um, I had heard about the uh, MDAS a, a while back. I've been in and out of the Bay Area, um, but I came, I lived up in El Dorado Hills uh, in the Sheriff Foothills for a while mm -hmm. and came back recently. And uh, I've been a visual observer for 25 years or so and uh, just started getting into uh, astrophotography and I'm I'm hoping to, to learn more from the uh, combined wisdom uh, here in the MDAS uh, for both visual and uh, astrophotography. So okay. thank you for uh, letting me join. Sure, yeah, and you should be aware that we have a imaging group. Um, I don't happen to have that information readily at hand to be able to tell you how to do that, but- I'm, I'm already joined. Well, yeah, very good, all right, good for you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Hi, my name's Sean. I just joined. Uh, and I actually don't remember how I found out about this. Uh, I live in Walnut Creek, and I think I stumbled across it via a Facebook group or something. Uh, but I, I've gotten into astronomy recently and uh, over the summer, a lot of telescope. And so, yeah, I'm here to learn. I have small children in the background, so I'll be uh, muting myself now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch the last name. I'm sorry. It's uh, Mick Lucas. I'm sorry? Sean Mick Lucas. Oh, Sean. Okay. Anybody else? Somebody else? Okay, I know we had a couple more, but maybe they haven't found us yet. Anyway, um, any visitors tonight that went along for the ride with somebody? Everybody? Yeah, sure. I'm a visitor who along for the ride here. Hi, Jeff. Rob, Rob, Jeffrey Rob Sparks from Tucson, Arizona. I work at Noir Lab, the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Lab by day, and I've known Jeffrey for quite a few years, and uh, he's using one of my pictures tonight. So I, he invited me to stop by and see what he's doing with it. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, um, announcements are next, and reminders. A reminder to keep your microphone muted, except when you want to ask a question, or if you need. To ask a question and minimize their interference with everybody. We got about 40 people on right now. So when you start getting three or four people chattering at the same time, it doesn't help. So we'll try to keep it to a dull roar. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see, our article deadline for the next newsletter is at noon sharp on February 30th. So if anybody has an article that they wish to submit to Marnie, Berenstein, you need to do that before then. Uh, then you would also want to visit our homepage at mdas.net. Don't just type MDAS, you won't get what you want. <laughs> Guarantee you. Uh, click on the newsletter link in the sidebar uh, to ask the, access the current as well as archived newsletter. And our next general meeting is scheduled to be the February the 23rd. So now this is going to be challenging because I don't know how exactly I need to do this. So first of all, I want to do this. This is an announcement. Uh, and where am I here? 
Oh, there we are. Uh, whoops, I can't do that yet. Uh, whoops, I want to do that again. Okay, let's try that. I will be sharing my screen uh, to that, and then I will be playing. There we go. And then we have, oh dear. What is that doing in the way? Okay. Bear with me for a little bit. I'm still figuring this out. Um, <laughs> somehow I happen to have something that's right in the way and I can't get rid of it. Okay, hang on. Just minimize it. There we go. Well, I did, except I've got this oh. banner that's right in the middle of where I want to get to a menu item here. So I want to start the slideshow. Okay. Uh, there we are. Can anybody see that? Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is uh, from uh, Paul Reed, who is recommending this YouTube talk, as you can see here. And it is on cosmic instability, how a smooth early universe grew into everyone you know. And I'll let you take a little while to read that. I hadn't expected this until an hour before the meeting. So, uh, like I said, this is courtesy of, our, courtesy of our outreach coordinator, Paul Reed. So when is this? This is on the 3rd of February at 7 o'clock. And let me see if I can... There's an awful lot there, but I think you recognize that it's... Um, involved with the Space Web Space Telescope, uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Sorry about that. And there's another page, and that gives you the information that you really need, which is Dr. John Mather. And the uh, URL at the bottom of the screen not only takes you to that current lecture on the third, but also the previous ones. And since this, oops, since this is being recorded, once we get done with that, it'll get posted to our YouTube channel so you can review this. And that should be plenty of time before that uh, February 3rd. Everybody got all that? Or do I need to wait a little longer? Or should I start it again? Is, is this info on the newsletter or can it be sent out in an email to the group so that we can uh, well, uh, just we click can... on the links? Um, Marty said she'd put it in the chat. Great. Okay. Yeah, I don't have my chat up at the moment. So, okay. We I just put it in the chat. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on then. Uh, the only thing I hadn't done is I hadn't sent this to Marnie, of course. So, um, I don't, hopefully, she's not madly trying to <laughs> copy all that. Maybe she just did a screenshot. Okay. We can always show that again if we want to. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. There it is. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, there. Now we got back to everybody where they're supposed to be. Okay. Uh, right now. So that is getting up to the next item. And I still don't see. 
Bear with me for just a second. Okay. Well, um, our um, speaker coordinator, Dick Flask, um, who has been our, or had received last year, the Joe Dish Award. Uh, he selects the next individual to get the Joe Dish Award. And so in lieu of the What's Up segment, which we normally would have at this time, uh, Richard has selected, guess who, Mike Arms for the Joe Dish Award this year. So you're probably wondering what in the world is a Joe Dish Award? So I did some digging and I located an article from December 2007 newsletter, which you can access on our website, by the then president Nick, and I'm going to butcher this name, Sequoias. I hope somebody can help me with the pronunciation. Sequoias. Sequoias. Yes, I, yeah, I yeah, Nick. <laughs> yes, Nick. It's Greek to you. <laughs> yes. So uh, out of that newsletter article, he writes, um, each year our club honors one of its members who has provided exceptional service to make our club what it is. So that's the reason for Joe Dish. Uh, who is Joe Dish may be another question a lot of people. Well, have. maybe maybe I can answer that. Oh, good. First of all, thanks, thanks to uh, Richard Ozer for bringing the, my Joe Dish award over. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, yeah. and I do have uh, actually a picture of Joe Dish. Okay. If I can okay. share my screen, I'll bring it up. Oh, uh, hang on just a second. I will okay. that. Hang on. Yeah, you need to enable that. Yep. Which we should be also. There you go. Everybody can see that? There you go. That's the one I was going to pull up. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm deeply honored uh, because I actually uh, knew Joe Dish, and I know a lot of people in the club don't know who Joe Dish was. And uh, But he was a member of our club for several years, and he was uh, up in age. You can see him with his cane there. Mm -hmm. But he was just a guy that loved life, and he was very into uh, club activities. I think this picture was taken uh, during an astronomy day at one of the shopping centers around here. And um, he was a member in the, the mostly, I think it was, I'm lousy with dates, but I think it was uh, in the 90s. And uh, somewhere along the way, probably right about in 2000, he passed away. Um, but he was always involved in all our outreach programs. He was he was just a funny guy. He uh, joked all the time. Uh, one of his big things, he was, uh, he always thought the Big Bang Theory was just a bunch of poppycock. And uh, so he had this big button he always wore. It said Big Bang Basher on it. So I think he just wore it just so people would argue with him. <laughs> but he was always also going up to Mount Diablo all the time, getting involved in all our public activities. Uh, but I do remember that uh, uh, he he was a musician and he taught music. In fact, uh, my wife actually knew him because he taught her in uh, middle school in uh, Lafayette. And uh, he also was uh, had played several instruments. And from what I remember him telling us, he used to play in some of the big bands and uh, like the 40s or whenever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he was a very inspiring guy. So. We always thought it would be great to have a some kind of honor every year in his his honor, basically, because he's he's so inspiring. So thank you very much. Well, you're quite welcome. And um, I have a again out of that same article, uh, and I'll just read the last little bit here because it does actually explain a little bit what you just did. And I'll use an excerpt here. It says, he knew the importance of appreciating new club members for the diversity of interests, skills, and knowledge that each brings to the club. And this is the most touching part. Yakutake, 
graced our skies in the spring of 1996, and as it departed, it took Joe Dish with it. So that was that article by Nick. So that was Erie passed. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. So that's why we started uh, 1997. And in fact, the first recipient of that was John Wilson. Okay, so uh, next item is, guess what? Our favorite, a five minute break. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to take a five minute break um, and please take this opportunity to locate your millimeter scale as mentioned in the email and we'll see you in a bit. So it's time for our main speaker, which is your favorite guy in mine, Jeff Adkins. And I'll let him introduce himself and, and describe what we're going to do tonight because I'll just knock it up. So I'll hand it off to you, Jeff. OK, okay. I can do that. Uh, I got my own dish, Joe dish story. I joined the club. Uh, I only know Joe a couple of years, but I was there while he was still an active member and I had a couple of lively by big bang arguments with him. Uh, he enjoyed pulling my chain and, uh, um, that was back. If you guys remember way back in the day when the club used to meet in a bank, uh, that was a long time ago. But um, anyway, I've been coming and going ever since. Uh, teaching keeps me pretty busy. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, you guys and show you a, a few things I've collected over the years. So I got some stories. We do have an interactive part. So uh, one of my things I do every year when I do this for you is there's something interactive. So we're going to actually do a parallax measurement and attempt to measure the distance. It is an earthly on the ground based one, but there's only six steps and the math is pretty easy. So I think you'll be able to participate with this along the way and see how you might do it yourself. If you wanted to do a parallax demonstration and understand how it works. And then I have some story pictures like Rob said earlier to share with you. I had a couple of stories about Rob too. All right, so uh, let me see, I guess I'll share the screen here. Okay. So, um, the reason that there's two per, uh, copies of the letters is because of the effect of parallax. So uh, I've been teaching astronomy uh, off and on, been working in education since 1986. And I've been teaching astronomy since about 1989, uh, off and on. And right now I teach at LMC uh, and also Deer Valley High School. And I uh, wrote the textbook that my students use and the activity you're going to do today, today, the interactive one, is, is adapted from that workbook. So um, this is the book they use in, in my online classes now and when I'm teaching live in person as well. That's probably enough to know about who I am. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. I have a lot of things to share. Okay, so let's see. I need to see the navigator so I can choose different slides. So what is parallax is an illusion actually. It's an illusion caused by the motion of the observer to make a near ground, nearby foreground object seem to change positions. So the very classic parallax demo, which you should all do with me, I wanna see it on your cameras, uh, is that you um, put your thumb in front of your face, maybe six inches away, but you focus on the distant background of your wall and you should notice that when you do that, you'll see two thumbs. So if I'm looking at the distant wall, I see two thumbs. So if then you cross your eyes to focus on your thumb, your eyes will be crossed together. And your brain can sense that inward bending angle that tells you um, that uh, the thumb is pretty close to your face. So you have a 
depth perception. They say we only have six senses, but that's not true. Here's another one that's not one of the classic senses. Your eyes can detect how much they're crossed and use that to gauge distance to nearby objects. My ex-father-in-law uh, had only one eye due to a childhood accident and uh, lacked de depth perception, had to judge distances to things like cars on the road by how far apart their headlights are. And uh, he didn't have the ability to bend both eyes inward and focus on an object. He lost that, that sense of depth perception. So in the parallax effect, we usually uh, have two observing locations in this picture that's the two eyeballs in the cartoon. Um, however, we can't be two places at once in astronomy. So what you do is you take a picture from one position, you wait till you're in the other position that may be on the other side of the Earth's orbit, or it might be somewhere else in the country. You take another picture. So let's try this. Hold your thumb in front of your face, focus on your thumb, close one eye, and switch eyes back and forth like that. And you will see the, the thumb appear to jump back and forth as in the illustration at the bottom right of the screen. Of course, your thumb is not moving. It's an illusion caused by the motion of the observer being in two different vantage points. So at this point, you realize the parallax is really commonly known as triangulation. And it allows you to triangulate on an object and tell its distance. So this is all about how you can do, uh, if you as an amateur astronomer, could you do some simple parallax? Measuring stellar parallax is extremely difficult even for professionals, but there are parallax exercises you can do with your backyard telescope that enable you to measure distances to objects. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of that. Um, I'm gonna say a couple of things that you probably already know, but I'll try to get into the, the good stuff pretty quick. So first thing that I'm gonna be saying a lot of is about arc seconds and I'm Pretty sure that anybody who handles a telescope is going to know about arc seconds, but I do have a little interesting trivia I did not learn about until you know uh, some just in a relatively recently. As everybody here knows, if you take a, um, a circle and divide it in 360 degrees, the reason there's 360 degrees is there's approximately 360 days a year, and three, uh, 360 is a really convenient number because you can divide it by four and six and uh, 10 and many other combinations. And so it's really handy to have a 360 degree protractor in our, in our uh, earthly existence here. And for a long time, degrees were more than sufficient to give precision measurements. But when the telescope was invented, uh, people in the, in the late uh, 1500s and early 1600s, Tycho Brahe was doing extremely precise measurements with gigantic protractors uh, that would be half the size of a house in some cases. And he needed to measure angles smaller than um, a degree. So um, ancient tradition has established the 60 slices, which were originally called the minute part of a degree. I think I just recently learned. And so that was sufficient for a while. As you may know, Tycho was famous for being able to make precise measurements down to one minute part of a degree, uh, what we would call today an arc minute. And he could make measurements down to an arc minute with his eyeballs and his giant protractors and cross staffs and things and get good answers. But as the telescope was invented and pictures became even more magnified, it became necessary to take that first minute of a degree and break it up into 60 tinier slices, as you see in this little second magnified view, uh, which were called the second minute part of a degree. So originally, these tiny slices of an angle subdivided into 60 pieces and then 60 pieces of 60 pieces were called the first minute and the second minute. People got tired of saying that, so they shortened it to minutes and seconds. So minute and seconds became minutes and seconds, and that's the origin of the terms minutes and seconds uh, after it's subdivided into the first minute and the second minute part. A uh, thing I recently learned, I just think that's really interesting trivia. So anyway, I'm pretty sure everybody here has some passing knowledge of arc seconds, so I'll let that go. Now, if you take pictures of a star, in the sky and you observe that it moves by taking a picture of it one time and waiting a while and taking another picture and you're able to detect by any means that the star has changed position. That uh, can only be caused by two things. Either it's because the star is moving itself through space at a tremendous rate, that's called proper motion. And for that to be observed from Earth, the star must either be very close to us or moving extremely fast. The other reason the star would move is because of this parallax effect, 
the earth is shifting back and forth in position. And that makes the star appear to wobble back and forth in place. And again, this must imply that the star is very close to the earth and not nearby at all. The ancients couldn't detect parallax because they're incredibly small angles. And this led them to the entirely logical conclusion that because the stars do not shift position nor do they change size, it's logical to conclude the earth cannot move if you don't realize how far away the stars are. So um, usually people present these arguments about the ancients thinking the earth not moving as a matter of physics because you can't feel the movement of the rotation. But the, the convincing argument for most ancient astronomers was that uh, no parallax was observed in the ancient world without telescopes. So they logically and correctly concluded the earth can't move. And it took the invention of the telescope and highly precise measurements to detect parallax at all. Let's talk about proper motion just for a second. This is a photograph of Barnard's star as is well known to be the fastest moving star in our sky. It is the fourth closest known star to our solar system. This short little animated uh, cartoon shows photographs of it over a several range period. Um, this is not very fast, highly magnified image. And uh, according to the usual references, it, uh, it will move about a quarter of a degree in a human lifetime, which is about half the diameter of the moon. And that one is the greatest, fastest proper motion observed uh, that we've ever seen in a star. So this motion is not caused by the parallax effect. This motion is caused by the star moving through space and is essentially making it move in a more or less a straight line. But I have more to say about Barnard's star in a little while. So just keep that in mind. The linear motion is just the star moving through space. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that again in a few minutes. So in the rest of this presentation is mainly about walking you through several examples of the parallax effect. I'm gonna tell you a story that, about Rob Sparks. You'll probably remember, you can remember parts of it I've forgotten. So Rob's here with us tonight. Hi again, Rob. And uh, I'll tell you about the project that we started on many years ago. And then a recent project I did on GPS satellites uh, uh, using photographs. <coughs> um, and then uh, one of them's Rob's. And then I have a picture to share from Mike who gave me a picture of, a, of a, another parallax scenario using an asteroid. And then uh, I have a paper that I found. I'd like to just kind of bump at you uh, and talk about the parallax of Barnard star. So we'll come back to Barnard star then. Um, our interactive project tonight is to measure the distance to a flagpole using the parallax technique. Uh, and you should be able to completely reproduce this effect on your own target. So you can do it yourself with your own photographs, uh, just with an ordinary cell phone camera if you like. I'm going to teach you how I did it with a flagpole and walk you through the steps so you can see how you might want. It's only six steps, a fairly low math load. All you need for this activity tonight is an, a working screen and a millimeter ruler. Normally I do this on paper and when I'm in my classroom we do it digitally with pixels to make it more precise, but uh, it is possible to do it with a millimeter ruler as long as all the pictures are the same exact scale. So I'll talk about how you might set one of those up for yourself in a little while. And finally, I'll conclude with stellar parallax and give you some of the challenges involved in doing, you know, why it's really difficult to do stellar, stellar parallax in an amateur class telescope. Uh, theoretically can be done, but it's, it's uh, quite difficult. I, I've never accomplished it myself, only read about it. So these projects are, are my uh, way of compromising with the fact that I don't have the astrometric um, background and skills to do the, the data reduction to get the actual data out of the photographs. So maybe that's a someday maybe for me, but I can at least talk about how it works and give you some heads up about how that might be. So let's dive in on these projects. The first one involving Rob, maybe Rob, you remember these pictures. Uh, here's how it, how it came to pass. Um, I got the idea some years ago back in 2004 that, hey, maybe I could do a parallax project, um, but I would do something that's much easier than parallax because even then I knew how hard it was. So I got the idea of maybe photographing the moon at the same time as somebody else in the country. So my memory is I put the word out on a list serve somewhere and said, is there anybody out there in the world who would like to do a parallax of the moon project with me and take pictures simultaneously? And I remember Rob uh, got in touch with me and said, yeah, I live in Wisconsin. I'll do it with you. Was it, isn't that where you were, Rob, in Wisconsin back in the day? Correct. Racine, yeah. Wisconsin, to be specific. Correct. So we got on cell phone with each other one night and uh, we both took pictures. 
Um, his is the better one, I think, down at the bottom. <laughs> Mine was pretty bad, but I got it to work. So we chose a day when I think that might be Saturn. We used as our background target some uh, relatively we bright Jupiter. That's, a, that's Jupiter. That's Jupiter. Yeah. Jupiter. We used. Yeah. So uh, we wanted to use a relatively bright object so my crappy camera could pick them both up at the same time. And so uh, we were on the phone and said, okay, you're ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Three, two, one, take a picture. And then uh, uh, we sent each other our pictures. Now, in order to do this work, you have to know the scale. And obviously, we have different telescopes and different cameras. So you, if you're going to do this kind of parallax work, you have to take at least one more picture. And that's a known object at a known distance. I don't have them in this PowerPoint, but I think Mine was like a ruler that was holding up two meters away and Rob did something similar. So we knew how many uh, pixels represented how many centimeters in the picture and do a little geometry to figure out the plate scale. So I have that right up somewhere, but I just wanted to share the story with you. And uh, we did the math and did the calculations. Um, so uh, Rob sent me his stuff, I sent him mine, and I didn't think any more of it. And, uh, I did the, uh, the geometry here. We figured out the, the baseline between uh, Wisconsin and Antioch, and I uh, figured out the parallax angle by doing the plate scale trick and measuring the gap. So basically, you get two angles and you subtract them from each other, the big one minus the small one, you get the parallax angle. Use a little geometry to figure out the baseline, do a little arithmetic, and you calculated the distance to the moon, which we got 236,000 miles, which I attributed the difference in that to the 239,000 mile actual distance uh, as us not being in the center of the Earth. So, you know, I think we did pretty good for a couple of crappy little pictures, you know, mine was bad anyway. The plate scale thing worked, all the steps worked and I wrote it up and took it to a teacher conference. Uh, and then I was telling the same exact story I'm telling you tonight. And I said, well, there's this guy, Rob, who helped me out with this and he took the picture. And then has anybody got any questions? And then Rob in the back raises his hand up and he says, yeah, I'm Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy who took the other picture and I had never met him in person. This is how Rob and I met <laughs> at a teacher conference when he was, he was uh, just kind of lurking in the background watching me talk about this and then he stood up and told his part of the story. So that, that was Sonoma uh, State University or EH. Is that the Sonoma when that happened? Yep. Yeah. That's Sonoma. So that's pretty funny though, isn't it? I just, uh, I still remember that just like you raise your hand up like that. I'm the other guy. Uh, so there you are. So a small world, I guess, for us astronomy educators. So that's the first one I did. And, you know, I, I documented that and I showed it to classes once in a while, but that's as far as I took it. Now, more recently, I was uh, cruising around Facebook and I saw Rob had a picture. I was, well, as Rob uh, posted a picture of, uh, uh, this isn't Rob's picture, but this is the other guy, Keith Gleason, who did it. And a friend, so, um, took a picture of the uh, Orion Nebula and revealed um, these little tracks down at the bottom, which are actual GPS satellites, because the satellites stay fixed in location above the surface of the Earth. If you do an ex timed exposure of a, of a part of the sky where there is a GPS satellite, the GPS satellite will leave a trail because the sky is moving and the Earth is not. Uh, Rob did one too, um, and uh, uh, I had this bright idea, yes. So those are not GPS satellites. GPS satellites are about 10,000 miles, if I remember correctly. Those are geostationary satellites. Oh, yes, yes, you're right. I said the wrong word. You're completely right. I meant to say GPS satellites. Not G I, mean, I meant to say uh, geosynchronous. geosynchronous. Yeah, so this word's wrong. Why didn't you tell me that in advance, Rob? All right, so synchronous. So I'm just going to fix that real quick. Oops. That word's too big. Make it smaller. There we go. Okay, so it says right there in the picture. So here's uh, Keith's picture of the geosynchronous satellites. And he actually figured out which one's which, which I think is cool. So uh, Rob posted his picture and uh, uh, Keith did his. And so I, I went to some effort to try to combine them. This is the two pictures added together. And you can see in the, in the top here, two faint trails of the uh, geosynchronous satellites, those are um, those are Rob's images, right? And it doesn't do it justice. His picture is actually better than this, but you know, the quality degraded a bit in me trying to, to scale the two pictures to line up the stars so I could see how far apart the two tracks were. I had this idea that if I could figure out the gap between these two lines, I could work it into some kind of geometry project and figure out the distance. And um, 
Uh, I spent about, I don't know, three or four days on about a dozen sheets of paper and some frustrating algebra attempting to do that. I did the whole plate scale thing and I figured out how many arc minutes these two lines are apart and I struggled with it. And I eventually came to the conclusion I, uh, I didn't have enough information to do a true parallax off of that because uh, again, the baseline is pretty challenging. But I figured out eventually what I had to do. I'm going to show you here. Uh, it's, uh, once I, I threw away all my notes and started over, pulled a Kepler and decided to try a different method, I figured it out. So what I did was I compared the location of a star in the photo to these uh, satellite tracks. And then I used Stellarium to point to that same star and get its coordinates, especially its declination. So the declination as seen by Rob of this star and this uh, track, and the declination of this track as seen by Keith, which I got just by comparing a very close nearby to the track to Stellarium. Didn't use anything fancy where I had to, you know, align the coordinates. It's, uh, these work on JPEGs, so they're not even FITS files, but it worked. So I got the two declinations. So uh, I discarded all of my horrible math and came up with this. I know it looks a little busy, but um, this actually makes some sense and it works. So uh, let me explain the diagram to you here. Here's the center of the Earth, and here's O1, which is, uh, I think, Rob, and then Keith is up here at O2 at a different latitude. Uh, Rob's at 32 degrees north, Keith is at 40.3. They gave me quite precise coordinates. Uh, I did assume the Earth is a circle. Obviously, it's not, but for the purposes of this little exercise, it worked great. So what I realized was if you knew the declination of the lines in the photograph, then um, those, the declination is the angle depressed from the celestial equator. So this declination down from the celestial equator matches the declinations you see here using a little basic geometry. I got these declinations. And um, the two L's are the latitudes of the two observers. G is the location of the geosynchronous satellite. I use the right word here. The geosynchronous satellite is here. And so I basically is setting up two um, triangles and using the law of signs to get it. So uh, uh, this list was originally much longer and had about three times as many identified points and it was a real mess and I wasn't getting anywhere with it. But this technique is now uh, is much easier because you're using as a distant reference point the celestial equator, which you can get directly from the photograph and any astronomy program. So this technique is called geocentric par parallax. And uh, if you look it up, you'll find the same kind of technique applied to other things. So anyway, um, here's your basic uh, setup. Here's a, this red triangle is the one I, I'm, I'm setting it up based on this one. So uh, law of science says if you know the length of one side and the angle on the other side, these two angles are the two declinations added together. Um, and then if you know uh, for one triangle, it's just the declination of one of the observers. So you know that one and this R plus X is how far the satellites are from the center of the earth. And then this interior triangle angle here is 180 for the degrees in a triangle minus the declination for the second one in this case, minus the latitude for the second observer in this case. Similarly, the smaller, darker triangle inside for the first observer. So just plug in all these uh, variables, solve for the distance r plus x. Here's Rob's numbers thrown in. Uh, Rob didn't supply these numbers, he supplied the photograph. I made the measurements, so all errors are mine. But uh, using Rob's photograph, I got 43,763 kilometers. Using Keith's, I got 42,384. Uh, so I got a 3% error off of Rob's photo and a half a percent error off of Keith's. So given the fact I didn't even consider the Earth to be a, you know, anything but a sphere, I think it's pretty good results for a you know, first pass at it. Jeff, can I jump in a second? Sure. Um, uh, my understanding is some of the satellites aren't exactly on the celestial equator. Yeah, there's as also, you can see by their some of them are offset with each other when you photograph them. So, yeah, they do drift up and down a little bit. Yeah, there's a and there's also a parking lot for them just beyond geosynchronous. Right. So you know if you you might get some tracks some things that are a little bit farther out that aren't actually geosynchronous satellites because um, when they are when they die, they Ooh. give them a nudge and push them out of the parking lot into a non geosynchronous orbit a little farther out. But that could so, be a uh, source of maybe a little bit of the error or something yeah. like that. You know, for my sake as a high school teacher, I get within 3%. I'm like, oh, God, this is gold. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, clearly demonstrates the technique. So this is probably about as sophisticated a uh, 
parallax problem ones I'm going to tackle in that context, but uh, I'm pretty happy with it. And I, um, I appreciate uh, Rob and uh, Keith uh, uh, sharing their photographs with me so I can tackle this little project and uh, something I can show the students. My students are highly intimidated by this, but uh, I might get some that uh, the occasional advanced kid who's, who's uh, intrigued enough to, to pursue it a little bit. But um, anyway, that's an example of how you might, with an amateur class telescope, do a parallax problem that would actually work, where you don't have to deal with the myriad number of corrections you'd have to do to even see the stellar parallax of a star. That's a little bit beyond my skill set, but this I think we can handle. So all you need to do is have somebody with enough skills to get the photograph and then uh, persuade them to give it to you so you can share it with the world. So that's my second example. Um, now we're going to do a couple other quick uh, pictures and then we're going to do our interactive activity where you're going to try and do a parallax. But uh, let's look at a couple more pictures. Mike uh, sent me this picture. Um, this one is uh, an asteroid. Um, uh, it was a flyby. Um, where was this published, Mike, this uh, little article that you gave me? Oh, this was uh, spaceweather.com. I had taken, my picture is, is the bottom one and I was just sick of with a 80 millimeter refractor. And uh, I was just kind of sort of guessing where this asteroid was going to be. And so I got this, all this, this track. And then about the next day, I see uh, Dennis DeSico, which is an editor at Sky and Telescope, published his, his picture. And I realized it was the same star field. And I looked at him, and you can see that they're offset a little bit. Well, he was in Boston, and I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm in here, you know, basically San Francisco area. And so I put it in uh, uh, spaceweather.com. And then about a couple of days later, I get contacted by some uh, professor of physics in Germany. And eventually he used this thing as an example of parallax and a physics workbook. So I got a physics workbook here in, in, in uh, German that has this stuff in it. Yeah, you can see the gap right here. If you look at this star in particular, how far it is from the satellite track and then look at the same star in your photograph, it's right on it. So uh, it's a much smaller ship because this uh, asteroid is considerably farther away than a geosynchronous satellite. So yeah, he, um, he mixed his with a 16 inch telescope and I didn't mind with an itty bitty small refractor. That's why they look a little different. But I think it's uh, if you want, if somebody wanted to pursue like your your physics professor guy, that's definitely possible to get a, a distance out of that. And the nice part about it is, um, you know, I don't think it depends too much on your longitude. It's mostly about your latitude because you got this nice long trail. So it should be something that I just uh, you know uh, I had a hard enough time with the satellite thing that I did, so <laughs> I wasn't ready to tackle this yet. But I appreciate it, and I think that it could be done. Obviously, somebody did it. So thanks for sharing that, Mike. Sure. Okay. Um, then I did a little research, you know, just clicking around the internet, and I found somebody who had done with amateur class equipment the uh, parallax of the Barnard star. So this would probably be the the one star that a person who was determined and had access to good equipment could work this out. And you have a reference here at the bottom from this guy named Vander Bay, um, and it tells step by step. It's very thorough. It's quite technical, but it would work. So I think somebody who was determined could photograph, he did here, photograph Barnard Star over um, 15 months and was able to detect in the photograph at high resolution movement represented in this graph here. So this is a right ascension declination standard star projection map here. And you can see there's three different positions that he's uh, uh, determined with his data. And then he did, uh, this blue line is due to proper motion. That's because the star is moving through space, as we mentioned earlier. The yellow line is the side-to-side -side swishing caused by the Earth going around the sun, and that represents the parallax motion. So what he was able to do is do a curve fit on three points. The yellow line shows the, um, the path of the star going back and forth around its proper motion as the Earth is moving side to side. So if you had the amplitude of this, like the amplitude of this yellow wave compared to the blue line, that would be... Uh, representing half of the parallax shift. You could use that parallax angle then to determine the distance. That's what he did. I'll leave this reference for you as a, you know, you can look that up if you like. But um, whereas the, uh, the analysis part is pretty sophisticated, I think it's possible that any of us uh, who do 
uh, astrophotography Barnard star is pretty bright um, relative to you know dim galaxies and things that you guys photograph. So it would theoretically be possible for you to, to do the parallax activity and repeat what this guy did. And you do have a nice example here. And he tells all the technical details. It's a stack of a best 120 eight second exposures on 2013. He tells what kind of telescope he has here. And then uh, the camera, the usual stuff that you would need to know to recreate the effect. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. Somebody else using amateur class equipment did in fact find a stellar parallax and got a really good answer for the distance to Barnard Star. So if you've ever wanted a challenge to do something yourself like the professionals do, that's what this guy did. Um, all right. Um, now it's time to start our activity that's interactive. So what I did was uh, I wanted to do something that was simple enough that my high school students would complete it, break it down in small enough steps they wouldn't get scared. So what I did was I went to my high school and I took a picture of this flagpole and a distant water tower that's something over a mile away, treating that as the, the distant background object. And then I just walked four meters down the sidewalk and did it again. So these are two uh, ordinary you know, digital camera pictures. Now, if you're gonna do this work, you have to take one more picture and that's where we're gonna start our process. You have to take a picture to establish the plate scale. And that's how many uh, pixels typically in astronomy represent how many arc seconds of angle. But uh, we're not gonna use pixels because um, we're not gonna struggle with the technology of measuring pixels. And if we don't have the same scale picture, it's real complicated. We're just gonna use millimeters. So the idea here is you convert these photographs into two angles, theta one and theta two, by using the plate scale. You find theta three, which is the parallax angle by subtracting them, and then a little trig problem with the baseline and you got the distance to the flagpole. We're pretending the water tower is a very distant object and doesn't shift much as you walk just four meters down the hall. So there are, uh, in the workbook, it looks like this, and students would actually take out a ruler and measure it on a sheet of paper. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure it on your screens. So as long as I don't uh, change the scale, all three pictures that we need are taken with the same exact zoom settings on your camera. This is the trick to doing it yourself. You need to take three pictures, two of them representing the parallax effect from two different vantage points, and a third picture to establish the plate scale of a known object at a known distance so you know everything about it. So we're gonna start with that. There are six steps here, and uh, I'll have you start with this one. The first step is, and all our numbers are not gonna agree because all your, your monitors are different scales, but all of us should get the same answer. So you take your ruler and you measure how wide is this sign? Not the photo, the sign. This is a room sign in the hallway outside my old classroom. So you don't know how many millimeters it is. Don't trust my ruler, it's not a real ruler. Use your ruler. Now these aren't really millimeters because the scale is not fixed. So you measure from the left edge of the sign in millimeters and go to the right of the sign. And I can't tell you the right answer because all your monitors are different, but you have to write that number down and uh, remember it. So you have a note for that. Um, I have a request to make the slideshow full screen. Unfortunately, that doesn't work in Zoom with this uh, slide program. This is as big as I can make it because if I make it full screen, it tries to show the presenter notes and doesn't show the slide because my uh, my uh, presenter software is a little old and it doesn't work well with Zoom. That's the best I can do. I can try to make it. It's as big as it's going to be, I think. That's as big as I can make it. And I can't change the scale in the middle of the presentation. You're all screwed. So it may be kind of small on your screen, but you can measure it. If you decide to zoom in on your screen, magnify it. Just don't change the magnification until we're done. I changed it. Okay, so um, I'm not moving the scale anymore because I don't want to mess up the scaling of the image in your projected image here. So measure the sign, make sure it didn't change when I did that little adjustment thing and jot it down. Anybody have any questions about this? Okay. 
So give me a thumbs up in the video when you got that number so I know I can move on. You don't have to do the digital one, the real one's fine. Unlike my classes, most of you turn your cameras on. <laughs> That's a real trick to get them to turn their cameras on for the class most of the days. Let's move on to step two. We have to figure out the plate scale. And this is gonna tell us how many uh, uh, degrees is represented by a millimeter. Degrees per millimeter is our scale we're gonna use. So that means we have to figure out how many degrees wide the, the sign appeared to the camera. When I took this picture, I was exactly measured with a two meter long meter stick. My camera was exactly 200 centimeters or two meters from the wall. And the sign in real life, uh, not in the photograph, the sign in real life is 30 centimeters wide. So this step, you just need to watch because I did it for you. But uh, you do need the number. Um, <clears throat> so the plate scale uh, here is the uh, the is going to be the first half of this is done for you. We need to figure out what this angle is, and it's uh, the arc tangent of 15 divided by 200 gives you half of the angle, and then you multiply by two to get the whole angle. So I did that for you, and so this angle here, which is the angular width as seen by the camera of that sign is 8.57 degrees. Now this step you have to do yourself. For this uh, lab exercise, 8.57 is a constant, and you would need to do this same step with whatever object you choose to photograph to make your plate scale. It could be a ruler that you just photograph hanging on a wall. That's what Rob and I did when we did the moon project. We used a ruler to establish the plate scale. For this one, I just used a room sign that I knew how big it was. So the 30 centimeters here is how wide the actual sign is in person without a camera. And so uh, you take that 8.57 degrees, which is the angular size of the sign seen by the camera, and divide by the number you got for number one, which is the width of the sign in millimeters in your ruler. That will give you the plate scale for all three photographs and tell you how many degrees are represented by a millimeter on the picture. And you should get a pretty small number because the, the picture is probably quite a few millimeters wide. I would be really surprised if you got a number bigger than one. It should be a small decimal. So once again, what do you do? You take 8.57, which is a constant for everyone in the activity. You all use that number, but you divide by the number you got for number one, and you'll get a small decimal. And its units are degrees per millimeter and establishes what's called the plate scale of the photo. So we know how many millimeters represents how many degrees. So once again, when you complete step two here and you have got the plate scale number, give me a thumbs up to tell me that you're all done. Uh, you're not supposed to have exactly the same answer, but if you don't mind maybe typing in the chat what you've got, uh, just to fulfill my expectation that you're all getting, you know, somewhat small decimals. <laughs> right, so there's a range of answers and it depends on how big your monitor is. Obviously this would work better if you had a larger image, but um, you know, I'm stuck with this, so I'm sticking with it. Now we're on to step three. There's only six steps. We're moving right along. So the first thing you need to do is get the parallax angle one from the first photograph. And so here where you put your ruler is, put it between the pole and then you measure to the left edge of the water tower tank, which would be right here. So it's a very small number of millimeters. Zero is in the center of the flagpole. And then the left edge of the water tower is the other one. And my fake ruler here, it looks like it's about six millimeters, but don't take that number because my rulers are not all the same scale. Can't trust it. You have to do it with yours because these photographs are exactly the same size and they're all the same scale. So if you use the same ruler throughout, it should work. You're gonna get a small number, let's say six millimeters, and then here it says, multiply by the plate scale you've got in number two and call that P1. So you multiply, you measure the gap horizontally. I'll occasionally have students try to measure the top of the flagpole down to the water tower. This is all horizontal angles, no vertical angle aspect to it. So go horizontally from the flagpole directly to the left edge of the water tower, a very small number of millimeters and multiply whatever you get by the plate scale number and jot that down. 
call it P1. <clears throat> Remember, all we did here is we took three pictures. The first one was of a known object at a known distance to establish the plate scale. Then we picked a target. That target could be something like, I don't know, Mount Diablo. If you could take photographs of Mount Diablo from two parts of Contra Costa County with different stars in the background, you might be able to measure the distance to Mount Diablo from your neighborhood. But this is more ordinary scale, so to make, not, uh, make it measurable enough for us to get reasonable answers with high school students <coughs> or astronomy clubs. So give me a thumbs up when you get P1 done and you have that number written down. I don't want to race ahead too much. Obviously, this one should be a little bit bigger than the plate scale because you're multiplying it by a small number. We're choosing millimeters. If you can uh, have a good enough ruler to estimate fractions of a millimeter, go ahead. That might help. For parallax measurements, precision matters. Even this one, which is a crude example, but this one. All right. Looks like I got a lot of people waiting on me. Let's take a look at the other batch of people. Right, not a, not a lot of those have cameras on. So I'm talking to you people with your cameras on. Looks like uh, if you're ready for me to go on, give me that thumbs up one more time. I don't want to lose anybody here. All right, thanks for that. So it uh, looks like we're just going to repeat ourselves. Do exactly the same thing on this one, but notice the gap is much larger when I walk down the hall. So you're going to get a bigger number flagpole to the left edge of the water tank on the distant hill, and you're going to get a bigger number. So whatever you got the first this one's bigger. There's only six steps. Finish this one. We've only got two more to go. Um, I guess, uh, what time is it scheduled to end? Because I don't want to, I want to pace myself so I don't run out of time. We usually go to nine. All right, Planet, we're, we're great for time. That's good. Okay, so when you get step four done and you found the second parallax angle P2, once again, give me a thumbs up. Um, and you've done exactly the same thing again. So you've got P1 and P2. Believe it or not, the hard part's over, almost. We're gonna do two more little steps and we'll have an answer and we'll see how close you got. I gotta confess to you, I've never done this digitally through a Zoom class before. You guys are my guinea pigs for my spring classes to gonna do this activity, not out of the workbook. So, uh, you know, Hopefully, if it works for you, I can, use, I can use it with my community college students, but we'll see. I'm moving on to step five, really hard. Subtract the big one, take the little one and subtract it from the big one. So subtract them on your calculator. And then we have to convert that's in degrees, but our parallax formula depends on radians. So once you've done that subtraction, Multiply by pi and divide by 180. That'll convert it to radians. So once again, two parts to this. First, subtract P2 minus P1, big one minus small one. Subtract them. When I do it on my paper copy, admittedly not the same scales you guys are using, but when I subtract it, I get it around two for, um, for the subtracted value, and then you multiply by pi and divide by 180, it becomes a very tiny number again. So when you subtract the two angles, you're probably gonna get something in the order of two. If you're dramatically different than that, there may be an issue, but something like two, if you ever take some decimals. Then you take that number, which is P2 minus P1. And then you multiply by pi and divide by 180, and it's going to be a tiny little decimal. So it's not a very big angle. 
in radians especially, it's not a big number. Okay, pausing again. Just give me that thumbs up when you're done with step five. There's only one step left. It's much easier than this one. Just trying not to leave anybody behind. I still see people calculating, so I'm gonna pause a little bit longer. In the next step, we're gonna find out the answer, which is, remember the question is, how far away is the flagpole from the person who took the picture? We're using parallax technique to measure the distance from the observer to the intermediate object, assuming the distant object is very far away. Thank you for that. So our goal is to find out how far is the flagpole. I'll tell you a little stalling story why I see people still working up. There's a little stalling story about this kind of estimate. I did a, in my uh, college days, I did, I was a TA for an astronomy class and they were teaching about how to do tangent equation to measure the height of a building. So you measure the angle up to the top floor and then you measure the baseline by walking to the building and you estimate how tall the building is and the students were supposed to report to me, the TA, how high the building was. So they dutifully said, it's a five story building on a small college campus, not very tall. 150 feet plus or minus 20 feet. They're supposed to estimate how far off they think they could be. 120 feet plus or minus 30 feet. 106 feet plus or minus five feet. And then they turned in the answers and I typed them and then the next person came up and she said, 5,280 feet plus or minus zero. And I said, what? I said, what makes you think it's plus or minus zero? Why are you so confident? She said, well, I didn't get that. I got 4,900 feet, so I figured I did it wrong. It's actually a mile on purpose. So they measured it, so she determined the building was a mile tall and uh, turned out to be a I'm in radian mode error. So we fixed that up. But uh, it taught me to tell the kids, you know, just because the calculator says it doesn't mean it's true, it will lie to you as soon as you look at it. It is a liar. So don't trust the answers if they come out to be unreasonable. Question everything. We're about to do that ourselves to see if the answer you get makes sense. This fits on a high school campus. The flagpole, I'll actually show you a picture of the campus in a minute. The flagpole is not that far away from us. What would be a reasonable answer? What would be an unreasonable answer? Let us move on to the final step six. This is the parallax equation. Distance equals the baseline divided by the parallax angle. You don't have to use the tangent function because in radians, small numbers of degrees, small numbers, small angles in radians equals the tangent of the angle. That's called the small angle approximation. So we don't even need to press the tangent button. You just take the baseline, and I have to tell you this, you don't know it because you weren't there. I walked four meters down the hall to take these two pictures. So you take four and divide by your previous answer to step five, and that will be how far away you think the flagpole was from the camera. That is the answer. And at this point, I'd like to see those answers popping up in the chat once you get them. Four divided by your previous answer, what do you get? Randy's first in the, into the thing. He gets 110 meters, 107 meters we got from Matthew. So we got two answers in the ballpark of 100. So notice that since everybody has a different computer monitor, the final answer doesn't matter. We're getting a whole bunch of answers in the same ballpark. By now it's in that zone that if you don't get something around 100, you're not gonna type it in because you know you feel bad because something went wrong. But a lot of folks are typing in the chat, 107, 108, 107, 110. So within a margin of just a few meters, you're all pretty much in agreement. Now let me share this, change the sharing focus as we conclude our little activity. Again, I wanna point out, this is cell phone camera level technology, right? Three pictures is all you need. Two pictures from two different vantage points with a nearby object and a distant object. Those could be astronomical. Um, but if you wanted to try it out, just to try out the technique, you need three pictures. And the third picture has to be an object of known size at a known distance to set the plate scale. And you can repeat everything we just did and do your own parallax exercise and say, I did my own parallax. So let me show you what, uh, 
the answer turns out to be. I'm changing the sharing focus here. I'm going to switch to Google Earth and show you where this uh, this thing actually took place. So uh, here's a picture of my campus in Google Earth where I work. Well, I work at home now, but you know what I mean. So my classroom, by the way, is over here where our planetarium is that I haven't used in eight months, but it's in this building. So uh, uh, actually this, uh, this middle part here is all me. I have a room that's about three times bigger than a regular classroom. Hey, this is the- I, I'm not seeing your screen. I, you're not? I don't oh, let me try. Mine. Hang on. I think I know why I did, what happened there. I can fix that. How about now? There we go. Uh, I learned Zoom has a flaw that if you move a window from one monitor to another, it loses the sharing focus. I, I forgot that for a second, but that's why that is. So anyway, this is my building. This part here is my classroom. That's the auto shop, currently not in use, even when we were in session. And this is the computer lab and robotics lab. So I have like the largest regular classroom in the entire campus, aside from gyms. A great big room it has a planetarium in one end and my classroom, a full-size classroom in the other, a computer lab over here and a um, storage room over there. So I've got quite a bit of real estate that they let me have. Uh, could be could be a lot worse. All right, so anyway, let's move over to uh, where the experiment took place. Um, and I'm gonna get a top-down view on this. Uh, picture was taken from this hallway underneath on this awning. So the four meter walk was right here and that's the middle of it right there. The flagpole you see in the picture is barely visible right there as a little smudge and the base of it's inside this little diamond. So the distance between that diamond and that hallway is the answer according to Google Earth. So I'm using the distance measuring tool on the ground here and then uh, I'm gonna move the uh, there's a little window here. I don't know if you can see the little window that reveals the answer. Um, it's probably not showing you that, is it? It's just showing this the one window. I can fix that though. So let me fix that so you can see I'm not making this up. That would be this window. Now you can see when I do this, um, the window that shows the answer appears. So as I drag the line, it shows the ground distance between these two points. And that would be right about there. That's exactly where the flagpole base is. Yeah, and cool. that's exactly where I stood. And according to Google Earth, we're 107 meters away, which several of you hit bang on and some of you got a little bit different ones. So uh, for the majority of people responding in the chat, you got the right answer. If you got double that, um, there's a two um, missing somewhere in the formula. Maybe that, that might explain it. If you get a crazy answer like a decimal number or thousands, it's probably a radians conversion problem. But anyway, for the majority of you participating, looks like in the chat, you got an answer in the ballpark of 100, and that is about as big as the school football field. So just to compare that to see if it makes sense, here's the football field. There's 100 meters right there. 100 yards, 100 meters, pretty close. And that's about the distance between that hallway and that. So, um, that worked. All right. So yeah, now you can say I did once upon a time, I did an actual parallax problem myself. So it may not be, you know, astronomical parallax on proximal and centric, but you know, you did an actual parallax problem and worked it through. Conceptually, it's the same problem when you do stellar parallax. You have to establish the plate scale. The measurement of the star's position is much more delicate. And there are many corrections you have to make because there are lots of effects that are bigger than parallax that will interfere with your measurement. But in principle, it's the same idea. You need to set the plate scale on the camera and you need to figure out what that is. And that's done down to the arc seconds per pixel kind of thing. Um, with that kind of precision, you might have a chance of doing stellar parallax. So now we enter the last segment here, which is the stellar parallax part. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the homegrown parallax activity or what we just did before I get into the next thing. Okay, so I switched back to the PowerPoint. Um, hopefully you can see that okay. Now we're gonna talk about stellar parallax. In this case, again, measuring these angles is quite challenging, but once you have them, 
the interesting thing about parallax, it's hard to get the measurement, but using it is easy. Because in this situation, the astronomers have established a system where they use the parallax baseline of one astronomical unit. And then the angle is defined as half of the, the shift from one side of the orbit to the other. That's what we call a parallax angle. <clears throat> they invented a system that if we use a baseline of one AU for the Earth's baseline and a standard angle of one arc second, then there is a fixed distance between the observer and the star. This is a, uh, a definition of what a, is now known as a parsec or a, con a contraction of parallax arc seconds. So an object that has one uh, arc second of parallax, not a fraction of a degree like we did, like half a degree or whatever, but this has got one arc second, not one arc minute, one 3,600th of a degree shift when the entire earth is the baseline and not just walking down a hall. It turns out the distance is one uh, parsec as we define it, which turns out to be equivalent to 3.28 light years. So I um, wanna emphasize that parsecs are a unit of length and conceptually they're similar to yards relationship to feet. They both measure distance. Three feet make a yard, three light years make a parsec. So um, it's a considerable distance. Nevertheless, 3.28 light years you might notice is a shorter distance than the distance to the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, 4.1 to 4.3 light years. So this tells us that the largest known parallax angle of an actual star is even smaller than one arc second. It's only a fraction of an arc second. Well, while we're talking about parallax, I have to say this. Everybody knows this, right? So uh, ever since this uh, scene came out, it's the only time, you know, in, up until that point in history, the first time you ever heard the word parsec in a movie and, and then they screwed it up because he, in the grammatical structure of the sentence, Han Solo is treating parsecs as a unit of time. Now, if you've seen the new Han Solo movie that came out a couple of years ago, um, they kind of kind of what they call backfilled the story to try to explain what this means because he's taking a shortcut through a complicated nebula and his shortcut's shorter than everyone else. So then it takes distance makes sense. But this is just trying to make excuses for, you know, George Lucas using the wrong word because it sounds more sciencey than just saying, you know, a number of hours. So um, anyway, that's a whole thing. And they actually tried to fix it in the, in the solo movie. Anyway, uh, you can't talk about parsecs without telling this story. So I had to say it. So back to stellar parallax. Um, how do you use it now that you've got the angle? If you use the, uh, the, the defining equation for the parsecs where a parallax of one arc second is defined to be one, uh, one uh, arc second of angle gives you one parsec of distance. Then this nice little formula here, this is the beautiful thing about stellar parallax. Uh, the parallax angle equals one divided by the distance in parsecs. So, and you can reverse that, the distance equals one divided by the parallax angle. So for example, if you're hundred parsecs from the earth, your parallax angle would be 0.01 uh, arc seconds. And similarly, if a seven arc seconds, the distance would be one divided by 0.7 is 1.4 parsecs. So this little part right here, which I'm going to circle for you, this is the, uh, the, the really nice thing about um, stellar parallax because it is hard to get, but once you get it, it's easy to use. That's the, the stellar parallax equation. It doesn't have a tangent in it. It doesn't have any complex formulas. All you need is the parallax angle in arc seconds and you get your distance in parsecs. So I like that part. That part's pretty easy to manipulate. Okay, so um, what else can we say about stellar parallax? Let me clear this. Yeah. And go on to the next one. Yes. It's a very, those are very two very pretty words. What words? Stellar parallax. Oh, I like those words, yeah. <laughs> uh, it sounds sciencey when you say them. I, I did have a question about um, the, I under, I'm understanding how you get to the, you know, the answer with the two images, but the person that did that one Barnard star just had the image of the one star, right? Or no? 
there's three different pictures uh, overlaid on top of each other. Okay. So uh, what he did was uh, he put them on the same scale and then plotted their position has uh, like used a, an astrometry program to determine the precise position of Barnard star in his images. And then this isn't actually a photograph, it's a graph of the three positions he got from photographs like this one up above is what he actually generated. Oh, and there's okay. Barnard star. So using some kind of astrometry program where you can lock in on the positions of all the stars in the photograph and then the software can measure the position of it quite precisely. And he took those right ascension and declination numbers and plotted them on a graph and this is what he got. Okay. So this little glowy thing is just a cute illustration. It's not a photo. All right, thank you. That makes sense? Yep. And it needs three stars at least to establish this curve. More pictures would be better, but there's three is a minimum to establish this uh, sine wave kind of curve to, to get the parallax shift. This is how far it is away from the blue line at the maximum width. Okay, so uh, <coughs> earthbound parallaxes. Uh, what about the closest star to us? Some stuff. Cassini did simultaneous observations of Mars and used uh, earthbound parallax like Rob and I did with the moon to figure out the distance to Mars in 1672, not too long after the invention of the telescope. So that people were doing parallaxes that soon to get estimates to the distance to nearby planets. By 1838, Bessel did the first parallax of star. The first one measured by triangulation was 61 Cygni. Um, as we all know, Proxima Centauri is the closest star. Its parallax is the very largest uh, parallax angle of any known star which is 0.77 arc, arc seconds that generates a distance of 1.3 parsecs or about 4.23 light years, excuse me. Now um, limits on mo or modern earthbound telescopes are limited to the size of the smallest angle they can measure because um, the incredibly tiny um, parallax shifts in most cases are less than a pixel and you have to use statistical methods to, to pull out that angle. So it's really hard to get those tiny parallax angles. And based on limitations due to the Earth's atmosphere mainly, your typical earthbound professional scale observatory telescope can only measure a parallax angle down to about one hundredth of an arc second, which corresponds to about 100 parsecs or only about 300 light years. Within that range, there are stars, an illustration of the brighter stars in a hundred parsec range. Some of them that you might know like Algiba, and Regulus are within 100 parsecs uh, of the Earth, and you'd know a few other names as well. But uh, there are plenty of stars, obviously, in the galaxy that are farther than this. So uh, in order to get a greater accuracy, in the 1990s, the European Space Agency launched Hipparchos, which is outside the atmosphere and eliminates that atmospheric blurring <laughs> in order to get extremely good uh, parallax angles. So using this uh, space probe, they were able to get parallax angles as small as 0 0.002 arc seconds, which corresponds to 500 parsecs. So accurate distances were then expanded uh, farther out into the galaxy. Why this is really important is that you have to have uh, a big enough range using this extremely trustworthy parallax technique to hit stars like Cepheid variables, which are used as uh, standard candles to get distances beyond 500 light years. So, you know, Cepheid variables are highly predictable and we know how bright they are based on their pulsation rate. And if you have a few of them within parallax range, you can use them to set the scale so that you can look at Cepheid variables pulsating far beyond 500 light years and use them to estimate the distances to things like other parts of the galaxy or nearby galaxies. So doing the precise uh, parallax thing is the first step of what they call the cosmic distance ladder and uses it to overlap with other techniques such as the Cepheid variable method to measure distances so that you can you can expand your knowledge of accurate distances beyond what uh, uh, parallax can do. But even more surprising than this, this, this really expanded our ability to do precise um, parallaxes and they're still analyzing this data even though the project ended in 1993. People still refer to it in research studies. But uh, more recently, a new uh, space probe recently launched is called Gaia and also an ESA mission. And it's located at uh, the L2 Lagrangian point beyond the Earth, away from the sun. And it kind of hovers there. And uh, it has a, 
baseline about the same baseline, but a much higher precision camera with uh, higher resolution. And it looks like uh, they're estimating that their, their best parallaxes are gonna be as small as 0 0.0001 arc seconds. They estimate uh, in their proposal when it was built that they'll be able to measure distances almost as far away as 30,000 light years and within a 10% measurement error. And that would mean all the way to the galactic center with parallax instead of stopgap methods such as Cepheid variables and other methods that are uh, you know, not quite as trustworthy as good old triangulation. So this is the cutting edge of, of parallax today. And Gaia has uh, been launched in um, 2013 and still orbiting. And the mission uh, doesn't have a clearly defined end date, but there are maneuvering thrusters that will eventually run out of fuel. So there's going to be an end date maybe around 2024. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on. I've only got four more slides, so feel free to interrupt. Uh, that's not interrupting. Feel free to ask. You're not interrupting me. That's why I'm here. But uh, Or to uh, unmute yourself and speak up if I don't see the chat pop up or anything. But just kind of giving you a, a view of what the professionals are dealing with here. Um, you can do parallax anywhere you can send a detector. So uh, here's a really interesting thing. The New Horizons space probe, which has now gone far past Pluto and gone beyond uh, some of the inner Kuiper belt objects, is uh, here's Pluto and uh, um, one of the more distant Kuiper belt objects, and it's out past that. And it has a pretty good camera on it, it's still operating. So they've actually done a project where they've used the camera on board New Horizons to do an extremely wide baseline parallax measurement. Um, so this uh, picture jumping back and forth is Earth versus New Horizons. Uh, I believe that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's Proxima Centauri. So they're able to see a, like a visible jump instead of just a sub pixel shift, a visible jump in the two photographs that's easy to see from that extremely wide baseline and uh, use it to help calibrate, you know, the positions of uh, the spacecraft and the known parallax angles measured from Earth's orbit. So that's a little project. Here's the link to it to tell you. Uh, so people are still doing parallax experiments even today. This is a, a kind, of, kind of a hot topic. The science of measuring star positions is called astrometry. And uh, the advent of the digital camera has really revolutionized it because we can get much more precise measurements than we could back in the old days. Jeff? Now, uh, here's a slide to make you worry a little bit. Yes. I was going to say that uh, Todd Lauer. Todd Lauer of Noir Lab was the chief person who was doing that parallax with the New Horizons. Oh yeah, tell us and, about it. And earlier, earlier this well, last summer, I interviewed him on our live from Noir Lab series. So if you go to Noir Lab's YouTube channel, you can find the archive of that interview where he talks about that project. Maybe you could dump a link to the site in the chat here for us. Uh, yeah, Rob, sure, can I can do that. that. That'd be awesome. Uh, for you guys who don't know, Noir Lab used to be uh, NOAO, same facility. So they've changed their focus and funding shifted and all that stuff. But, um, you know, um, I took some classes down there and Rob and I have been, you know, circling each other for years and, and um, you're still working down there. What is your job there, by the way? I don't actually know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and back. talk I about this. To get back I work in the communications, education, and engagement group. So I'm still doing science education, but it's not uh, in the formal classroom. I do a lot of our virtual programs now with COVID, of course. Outreach to Tona Autumn Nation, since Kit Peak is on the Autumn land. I run a couple of programs, one called Colors of Nature, which is a STEAM program for students, and our Project Astro program as well. And I do a lot of our social media and stuff like that. So I I do a lot of different things and literally communications, education, and engagement is the name. Well, let me, of let me put a bug in your ear because, uh, you know, these guys are always looking for speakers and mm -hmm. sounds like you and some of the folks at the lab might be good candidates for that. So if our, our uh, speaker coordinator could get your email address, maybe they could establish contact. Yes. Yes. We can definitely do that. Future presentation. I'll put, I'll put that in the chat too. Maybe you could, uh, that's awesome. Thanks Rob. Appreciate it. Okay, so we're getting close to the end of this. Let me just show you this thing. This is what the professionals have to deal with and why it's so hard to do parallax uh, in, in, a, in a conventional sense. 
first of all, the star is not a fixed point, but it's a fuzzy blur. So you, in order to establish its position, you have to do a thing called full width half max. You do a graph of its brightness as a function of position, and you're looking for this peak here, which is presumed to be the position of the star. So that's how you can narrow down the position of the star and make it a little bit more precise than just judging where the center of the blob is. You use a mathematical technique, which in um, things like the uh, Gaia mission is automated. So it, it, it automatically detects the center of the star using this uh, centering technique on the full width half max. max. So on the y-axis, we have the brightness of the pixels on the x-axis, their position. It plots a graph internally, finds the peak of the graph and calls that the position. The position of stars and earthbound telescopes can be affected by refraction in the atmosphere. So the lower you are in the sky, the worse it works. Um, air mass can have a big influence on the position, especially since you realize we're measuring things typically here that are sub-pixel shifts in the positions of stars. So doing it from the earth is, is quite challenging. Um, in, the race, in the literature, you also see references to trying to estimate how much the telescope's shape bends when you tilt it over. The flexing of the telescope causes tiny shifts in position on the, um, in the, in the camera. So that affects the precision as well. If you have a star anywhere near a gravity source or a star, say, for example, with a galaxy in the foreground or background, then the gravitational lensing uh, can affect uh, the bending of the position of the star, and you can't trust it as much for parallax. Um, of course, proper motion is a thing, uh, so you have to separate that out like uh, the guy did with the um, uh, Barnard star measurement. Uh, if you use filters on your photos, the different colors refract different amounts. So the way you avoid that mostly is you try to do your measurements in your zenith as much as possible. If you have plate scale, it might not be equal in X and Y because pixels are not always square. Um, and that means you'd have to use a, a plate scale based on the angle uh, across the plate. And that's another complication. So you can imagine if you're doing cutting edge parallax as a professional, uh, just doing one of them is a tremendous amount of data reduction. You have to go through all of these steps in order to filter out all the corrections. All of these things are bigger than parallax angles. The refraction is bigger than the parallax angle. So to, to eliminate them all, to just find the tiny little signal of the actual parallax uh, is really impressive in my opinion. It's almost amazing that anybody can do it in the first place. And that we did it, uh, you know, back when there was just film uh, we were able to get parallaxes you could trust from film photographs. So, um, you know, uh, I'm just uh, impressed whenever I read about the, the hoops you have to jump through to do uh, one of the most complicated data reductions necessary because everything here is precision. It's about eliminating error to get absolute precision on it. So uh, I am uh, somewhat relieved to tell you, I haven't ever done any of this. <laughs> Well, you know, you know what I've done because I just showed it to you, but I can appreciate it. So uh, that's why I'm telling you about it. Okay, on this slide, uh, I want to point out that the parallax effect can be used for lots of practical things. Of course, uh, 3D movies are uh, based on parallax because your eye is bending two images together by crossing your eyes with two different images and two different lenses. Did you ever wonder about this if you go to a 3D movie and everybody's looking at something coming out their face? If you stood up and walked down the aisle and looked at people's faces, everyone in the movie theater looks like this under their glasses. Their eyes are crossed. So, uh, you know, that's why you have a headache because you kind of overexercise those muscles. Um, and surveying, of course, is parallax based because it's triangulation. In Oakland, of course, they use the shot spotter system, which has microphones to triangulate triangulate on objects. So some of the arithmetic there is the same. Um, I would like to point out that uh, if you know what the picture is here, if you recognize that picture, maybe you could uh, tell us in the chat, who are these guys in the picture? Sorry to report, I showed this picture to my high school class and no one knew who they were. <laughs> I didn't know what this was. So now I feel <laughs> Yep. Yep. Okay. So, last picture. What is the ultimate expression of parallax? Are these fiendish things? 
Remember these magic eye pictures? Oh, sure. I can repeat the slides at the end. So here's the slide for the, the all the corrections you have to do for parallax. I assume that's the one you want to see, Nathaniel Bates. And then uh, these are all the things that if you're going to do a, a professional parallax measurement from an earthbound telescope, you eliminate some of them. The atmospheric refraction goes away if you're in a spacecraft. But uh, then you have other problems like uh, uh, differential heating of the spacecraft changes its shape from the sun. So that could change your parallax measurement. So they have different things when they use space probes. Nevertheless, I would expect that it might be a little easier because um, several of these things go away and they're no longer a problem. Okay, uh, so you're good there, Nathaniel? Okay. Rob's got a couple of links here for you in the chat. I might call it up for you. And then here's this uh, terrible magic eye thing. So I'm gonna leave that there while I look at Rob's link and get ready to, 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 to finish up. This is my last slide. See if you can figure out what this is using you know, the crossed eye effect, you, you cross your eyes and back up. Uh, when I do this, I know a lot of people say they can't see them, but when I do it, I get right up next to it and I unfocus my eyes and back up and then suddenly the picture snaps into place. So see if you can figure out what's in this one. The Saturn? Yay, you guys are good at this. You can cross your eyes correctly. So, Actually, I use, I use these all the time to enhance my psychic abilities, believe it or not. <laughs> Uh, here's uh, Rob's got a link here. I'm going to share it with you. And uh, then if there's any other questions, uh, my presentation is complete. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And I want to appreciate uh, uh, Mike sharing his picture and Rob uh, showing up to, to, to help us tell the story. Here's the picture Rob is sharing in the chat. Why don't you tell us about it a little bit, Rob? Okay, this is taken from Tucson last year. I, I've been photographing ISS solar transits for the last several years. It's a little bit of a hobby now, and lunar transits. And transits of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn I've gotten too. So I've done a lot of ISS transits of various objects. And uh, this is last August, a friend and I went out north of Tucson here near Oracle. We were about three and a half kilometers apart. I was using a Canon 80D camera and a 150 to 600 zoom lens, and she was using a five inch refracting telescope. And I zoomed my lens and uh, played with it till we had about the same focal length so we could get the images matched up. And there, fortunately, a couple of fortuitous sunspots there which helped with the image alignment. So we were actually able to, with a 3.5 kilometer baseline approximately, we were able to get this image showing uh, the very different positions of the ISS relative to the sun. For a transit like this, I think the transit path on this one was a little over five kilometers. I'd have to look it up to remember exactly, but so we were, you know, one of us was fairly far north of the center line, one was fairly far south of the center line with the five kilometer tra uh, transit, you know, two and a half kilometers north and south, and we were at like 1.7, 1.8. So uh, we were, you know, two thirds of the way to the edge of the line on each of those. So to, I overlaid the, the images and produced this image showing the parallax with the ISS in the sun. So that was a very fun little project we did last summer. Thanks for sharing that, Rob. That's a great picture. Your stuff on Facebook is just amazing. Um, so I'm a dabbler, but I just I can really appreciate it because it does take some planning to get those pictures. And uh, you do a good job with it. Thank you. Um, your warning the other night said the ISS was going to pass over Tucson. So uh, I looked up my house and I saw that it was going to pass. You know, it's heading in my general direction. It did pass over my house. So I ran outside with binoculars and looked at it, but I didn't try to photograph it. But uh, thanks for the warning and the tip. Okay, folks, if you have any questions, uh, we're officially, we're done. I don't know if you have any anything you want to ask us about, but I appreciate I the invitation. To repeat the, um, the slides again, if you which, could. Uh, which ones? For, for the parallax. I oh, might, for the exercise? I forgot to reconvert back using. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I just want to do it over, if that's all right. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let's see here. Here's step one, and I'll reshare that with you. Anybody else got some questions? Um, I'm checking the chat here. Um, okay, so let me just do that again. Okay. So uh, 
hope you guys enjoyed that. I, I do always enjoy getting to come talk to you and I hope uh, I, I keep getting invitations because it's, it's like a, a real, a real boost for me. I, I love doing it. And you Maybe next time it'll be Rob. And sir, you're saying that thing is really um, 30 centimeters? Is That's that correct. So if you were standing in front of it and not looking at a photograph okay. of it, it would be 30 centimeters wide. And uh, when I took this photograph with this camera, I was two meters away from it, using the exact same zoom settings, not touching them to take the other photographs. Okay. Right. So if we're, okay. So that's my conversion scale then, 0 0.015. Right. So whenever you're ready, just tell me go on. Step okay, two. Go ahead, sir, if you could. Well, All right. I should know well, that you. this is being recorded, so it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. So we have a... Uh, I'm kind of getting slim on time here. 8.57 divided by, got it. Okay, can you move to the... Uh, okay, go ahead and go to the next one, sir. Uh, thank you. If you guys have any final business for closing out the meeting, go ahead. I, I'm done. If there's, you know, I can hang around and finish this, but well, no, we're basically done. But okay, go ahead and do the next one. That all of this will be on available. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So okay. you, can, you can redo that at, at your convenience. Okay, twelve. So I got twelve. Uh, twelve on my measurement. Uh, so. Are you on for step five now? Um, millimeters, yeah. Tell so you what. Um, millimeter difference, P1 minus P2 is 12 millimeters. Okay. All right, so what's uh, the You've got to convert them first. Okay. Let's do this since we're trying to close out the meeting. You know, um, you've got my email address, right? It's uh, jeff at astronomyteacher.com. Sure. So if you send me a message, we can, uh, I can send you the... Um, a, the copy of the handout, and I can yeah. go through it with you. Well, that'd be better. But it looks, sounds like they're trying to close the meeting. Yeah. So here's my email address. In the chat. I was off by a factor of seven, and that's my conversion. So I think that's what I did. But okay. Oh. And here is the address. If you got, anybody has a question for me, when I follow up later. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Okay, well, I think we've got to wrap this up, guys. Okay, thanks a lot. And um, I do have a correction to make, by the way, before we all go. Of course, there's probably a lot of people have left already. Um, and that is, as Marnie points out, Marnie is our news uh, letter editor, compiler, compos compositor, all those sorts of things. Um, articles that are to be submitted for the newsletter are not, um, in other words, they're not generally requested during these meetings. So people who know, know that that's the deadline that I mentioned, which is incorrect for anybody else. That date would be the 21st, I believe she told me in her email. Let me just check again, make sure that's right. And um, so I did misspeak. However, the other thing that I have um, to mention, yeah, 21st of the month, um, is that uh, she has a, um, a series that she started doing, which is called um, Astro Live. And um, we've had a couple of those done by now. And again, those are all available now on the uh, uh, YouTube channel. So just uh, look up YouTube and mbas.net. Don't forget the .net part because you'll come up with something entirely different. So uh, so this, this uh, um, meeting, for instance, will be on there as well as um, uh, the Astro Lives and our previous meetings we've done um, recorded on Zoom. So both of those all be there on that one channel. So um, 
if you missed anything, go back and, and have a look at the YouTube. You can examine that at your leisure. So thank you again, Jeff. We always appreciate thank you. it. And um, I guess uh, we are about done. You're still sharing your screen, by the way. There we go. Oh, okay, I turned it off. There you go. All right. Um, I was actually going to show you something, and it's not as easy to do this way, but um, I'll do it this way. And that is a website, which I don't know if you can see this. Hang on a second. If not, I'll see if I can't share it. I don't know. It's called Movable Type. And I don't know if you've heard anything about that. But uh, it's from the UK, and I'll give you the URL, which is movable-type.co.uk. And I can type that in the chat in a second here. And it gives you, uh, among other things, calculating distance, bearing, and more between latitude and longitude points. And how I stumbled on this was um, um, one of my previous jobs we did um, we had to determine the accuracy of the, uh, you know, the uh, wrist, the uh, ankle bracelet monitors for knowing where certain offenders are and tracking them. Well, you can look at a Google Earth and you can put in the GPS coordinate and then find and, and change that coordinate very slightly and, and actually get a line between that first point and the second point and using uh, the Haverson formula, uh, you can calculate the exact distance because Haverson takes into account the curvature of the earth. And of course, that's going to be different wherever you are on the earth. So um, I will put that, let's see, where's my chat at? Oh my gosh, we have a whole bunch of them. Okay, I got to get back to that view chat. And okay, where are you? Oh, there we go. Uh, no, I need to put that to everybody. Okay, and that's going to be uh, uh, .co uk. There it is. Okay. Um, so it was really fascinating to be able to take a, a one of those GPS ankle bracelets and get the coordinate from it and then go ahead and move, you know, 100 meters or 50 meters or 10 meters, whatever. And you can still track where exactly it is. It's amazing. You got so many decimal points after the latitude and longitude you didn't even know about. Cool. I will take a look. Sure. Okay, then. Um, I guess we're all done. This is, I mean, there is nothing else other than saying goodbye. So see you later. Take care, Jeff. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. And we will stop recording somewhere along the line here. I got to.